And now we'll have a talk by Chris Ferris on student debt. Hi everyone, I'm Chris Ferris, and I'm going to talk today about student debt and some of the causes, uh, possible solutions, and the effects it might have on the future of the United States. Uh, so this is one estimate of the current level of student debt. Uh, estimates vary between 1.2 and 1.3 trillion dollars, and I included some of you because this is an ever-growing problem, and many uh, high school-age students want to take out uh, loans and take on debt to afford college. Um, so it seems like these days everyone from college students to presidential candidates is talking about this issue and uh, what we can do about it. So uh, I kind of wanted to look at why it has become such a major issue in recent years and uh, what has caused the explosion of debt. Um, so one of the major causes is actually just more students attending college. Uh, so even if every student was taking out the same as they always were in terms of debt, uh, more students would mean uh, a total debt a greater total debt, um, and there has been a major increase in the number of students attending college in recent years. And part of that is just because it's become really a major part of the American dream that you have to go to college to get the kind of job that you want, uh, to support your family and have the life that you want. Uh, but also in recent years, the Great Recession led to a lot of people trying to go back to school because they felt like they needed uh, more marketable skills to get the jobs that they wanted. Uh, but there also has been an increase in debt per student. Um, so the major causes of this are a combination of cuts in state funding and more students attending schools. So when you think about it, when more students attend colleges, as has been happening in recent years, the total costs of the colleges goes up uh, quite a bit. And there's been, uh, especially with the Great Recession in the last couple of years, there were budget shortfalls, which caused a lot of states uh, to decide to cut the amount they were funding their state colleges, which really drove up the tuition at state schools uh, because students were forced to kind of make up the difference with tuition payments uh, with a higher total cost and less state funding. Um, I think a lot of people think it has to do with you know, lavish spending or very high professor costs, and although there have been some increases in administrative costs, a lot of it really does have to do with just more students and, and less funding from the state. Um, a, a lot of the increase in debt has actually come from for-profit schools. Um, so if you see here, there's, there's a much higher unemployment rate for graduates of for-profit schools. Um, and that translates to much higher default rates as well. Um, a lot of this is because for-profit schools, if you look at the middle uh, kind of tan tiles here, that's the amount spent on education. And for-profit is the one on the far right. Um, so you can see that uh, although for-profit schools charge equal or greater uh, amounts for tuition in many cases, uh, the amount they're spending on instruction is actually a lot lower. And that's led to uh, the lack of value on a lot of the degrees that these graduates of for-profit schools are getting, which are preventing them from really reaping the economic benefits of a college education because the degree is not highly valued in the workplace. <coughs> And one of the reasons that so little is spent on instruction is because a lot of it is actually spent on things like advertising uh, to try and attract new graduates. And what you see in the top right is that all of this results in a three times higher default rate on student loans. Uh, because the people who are going to for-profit schools are paying similar or greater amounts, but getting a, a degree that has a much less value in the marketplace. Um, so if you look at this on the right, uh, you can see this, this measures the total amount of debt held by students at particular institutions. And the highlighted ones are for-profit schools. The left column is 2000 and the right is 2014. And what you see is this trend where uh, for-profit schools have really eclipsed other institutions in terms of the amount of debt held by students. And in addition, uh, just the, the amounts are greatly increased. For example, in 2000, NYU was the leader with two billion, and students held two billion in debt, and now really there's University of Phoenix, whose students hold 35 billion in debt. So really a drastic increase, and uh, it's a major trend. A lot of the uh, increase in debt has come from these for-profit schools, uh, almost 200 billion in just 10 years, or 14 years. 
Um, so, you, so you kind of see this for-profit effect where they charge a similar high cost, uh, but they often deliver a poorer education and a degree that's not as highly valued in the job market. And another major issue can be a very high dropout rate with students who attend these schools. Uh, what that means is that a student might attend for a couple of years, not end up with as much debt, but also not end up with a degree that's going to allow them to make more after graduation. So they have a lot of trouble paying off this debt. Um, and actually, some of these schools have been accused of lying about their uh, jobs figures, so uh, distorting the numbers that they show to students about what students can be expected to make after graduation. So they, some of them have been called predatory and actually been sued. Uh, but there is a general trend of just uh, the for-profit schools really profiting and students being left with large amount of loans, which their degree doesn't really allow them to pay off. Um, so in the future, what does this mean for things like the economy, and uh, will the problem of student debt improve over time? Um, so the economic consequences are pretty enormous. Uh, having a lot of debt or carrying a lot of debt really disrupts uh, what can be considered a typical life journey. So people might not spend a lot on cars, they might not go out and buy a house and start a family and spend a lot of money because they're scared of spending money because they're carrying a lot of debt. Um, and then you, you look at uh, starting businesses, it's very worrying because when you're carrying a lot of debt, you don't feel the kind of financial stability uh, where you have confidence and you want to go out and start a business. So the idea that 25 year olds who are supposed to be bringing the new ideas into the economy are uh, not going to start businesses because they don't feel like they have savings or financial stability uh, is really going to take a lot of the innovation out of the American economy, which has typically been a, a trademark of the American economy. Um, so then there are some presidential candidates like Bernie Sanders who have uh, made one of their major policy proposals to try to uh, reduce student debt and eliminate the amount that students have to pay when they go to college. Uh, so this includes uh, making public tuition entirely free and allowing for much lower interest rates for private tuition so that students are uh, not racking up as much debt and are more able to pay it off. Um, I actually uh, disagree with that plan because when you make college free for everyone, the people who are making hundreds of thousands of dollars and do have the money to uh, pay for school don't have to. Uh, so what that means is that the federal government is uh, subsidizing people who don't really need to be subsidized and the costs are much greater. So I advocate instead for more of the Pell Grant program, increased funding and increased usage, uh, which really tries to target people who don't have the money and really need federal funds to attend school. Uh, this would be a targeted approach that would make the amount the federal government has to spend a lot less. Uh, and then there are candidates like Marco Rubio who advocate a lot for information. So the idea here is that uh, there would be kind of a database <coughs> that has a lot of the information on median earnings after graduation uh, by school and by major at the school so that students could have this database that was free and easily accessible and very reliable and accurate to kind of look at how much they can expect to make after graduation and compare it to how much uh, loans or debt they want to take out. And this would help people make educated decisions and not get locked up with jobs that aren't very high paying um, and, and a lot of debt, or they at least would know that going in and uh, would be able to do more easily a cost-benefit analysis. Uh, and then there are other candidates who advocate for more transparency in the spending. Uh, the idea here is that if colleges are forced to really be transparent and show exactly what they're spending money on, then they might, be, they might be more forced to justify all of their purchases, and this would lead to more prudence in spending because uh, they don't want backlash from students who feel like they're spending a lot on programs that aren't helping the general student, but are helping more specialized groups. Uh, there actually is some potential for a lessening of the student debt problem as we move forward. Um, so as the economy starts to improve, uh, graduates are going to be able to find uh, employment more easily and they will also make higher wages which will allow them to pay off their debt. Uh, and in addition, there's been a lot of government scrutiny in recent years that's been pretty effective in limiting some of these for-profit colleges from really taking advantage of students. And as I said, for-profit is a major part of the drastic increase in student debt. 
Uh, so the, the, the idea here is that there would be less borrowing and more repayment because of the better economic circumstances. Uh, so to conclude, uh, the problem of a rapid rise in tuition could slightly be addressed by uh, more transparency in the cost. Uh, predatory for-profit colleges, which are a major contributor to the problem, uh, can be addressed with increased regulation and careful monitoring to make sure they're not taking advantage of students. And then additional help units to students who really need it would allow uh, a targeted approach which really helps people who needed a lot of financial aid uh, attend college at a much lower cost so they weren't uh, burdened with debt for years after graduation uh, and they were better able to you know, do the things like buy cars, buy houses, and start businesses because they didn't feel this heavy burden of debt. Uh, and then again, the, the potential for future economic gains, uh, people being able to get jobs and get jobs with higher wages would really help to address this problem as students would be much more able to pay off their loans in a timely manner and not have to default. So uh, I actually think there is a pretty uh, positive trend moving forward, especially as we institute some of the reforms like increased regulation of for-profit schools and increased funding to the Pell Grant program. Uh, so thank you very much. That's my presentation. <laughs> Any questions? Alex? Uh, what would be an example of a for-profit college? Um, so there's this group called Corinth. I mean, I can go back to the slide. It lists a lot of them. Are most of them online? Uh, some of them are online. So University of Phoenix is number one. But there was a company called Corinthian Colleges, and it's one of the major ones that uh, people are claiming changed, you know, altered the data on job outcomes. And they ran a bunch of different ones uh, under different names. But they are actually being sued now by a lot of former students. Uh, who think it was unfair and they lied about job outcome data and led to a lot of students being burdened with debt and not being able to get the jobs to pay the, uh, the debt off. Any other questions? What would be like the difference between like a for-profit university and I guess like a non-profit? Like other than the obvious, like they're making a profit, but like I think, I think that's the difference. That, but how, so what would, be, what would be the advantage of becoming a for-profit university? Like, so, someone else was thinking the exact same thing as me. Like, this is not ridiculous. Like, when, if I, so if you're a non-profit, then you get like tax cuts and all that. Yeah. So why, what is the advantage of being a for-profit? You make money. Um, is it just the ability to take more out of like, students? I think the goal is to make profits so that you know, people can make a lot of money. So what, what's appealing to going to any of those for-profit universities? Oh, well, so that's what I was saying. Uh, on this slide, when you see how little they're spending on uh, the actual educated people, a lot of it is advertising. So they, they run a lot of ads that attract people, even though it's kind of a, an operation that doesn't really guarantee you good outcome and actually we're burning you a lot there. Thank you. Sure. So those colleges that they run the ads for are those for people that are looking to like renew their education or like get a new start. So I feel like they're advertised as like a more affordable option for people that can less afford to re like go back and do their schooling again. So if they're like close to as expensive and they end up with more debt, I guess the advertising that makes people Yeah, they're pretty, not, not great overall. Yeah. They really take advantage of people who don't have that much money and they're not going to be able to pay okay. the tuition. So you would think the only reason that the people would feel like they would go is due to false advertising or... Yeah, I think that's a lot of the reason and I think that's why some of them are getting sued now. Yeah.